This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. On this summer morning, I welcome you to the worship and the fellowship of Delisle Community Chapel. Thank you to those of you who are here with us, and thank you for joining us online, for those of you who are watching from home or someplace else. I hope that wherever you are, you'll sense the presence of Jesus with us today. I want to read a psalm with you, and I want to ask you to help me with this psalm. I'm going to read the first part of the verse, and then you are going to say the second part. Fortunately for you, every verse has the same refrain, and it is this, his love endures forever. Let's, uh, let's try that little phrase. His love endures forever. If you're watching online, if you're watching from home, or even in your car, as long as you're not uh, the driver, we invite you to join in that phrase as well. As I read the first part of the verse from Psalm 136, we'll join together on the second part. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever. Who spreads out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great lights, his love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, his love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night, his love endures forever. He remembered us in our low estate, his love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies, his love endures forever. He gives food to every creature. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. We pray. God of heaven, we give you our thanks today. Thank you that your love endures forever. We love you because you loved us first. Help us to connect with you today in a way that is very real, in a way that is life-changing, so that we will be better and braver and more beautiful people when we leave this place than we were when we came. Be with those who are present in the sanctuary and with those who watch online today. Thank you that you are with us wherever we are all the time to the end of the age. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time we're going to worship through music. Let's uh, allow God to touch our hearts. Feel free to uh, sing along if you are uh, properly masked up or self-distanced this morning. All right, I'm not just sure uh, how well you can see what I'm holding here, but uh, I hope that you can see it. What do you see? Well, it's a flower, anyhow. It's a flower. Uh, what color is it? Can you see the color of this flower? What is it? It's a red flower. All right. Why is this flower red? Now, that's an interesting question. Why do you see this as a red flower? We know that sunlight is made up of all of the colors, and yet we see this flower as being a red flower. The red flower is bathed in the light of all the colors. It absorbs all of the colors except one. It does not absorb red. It reflects the red in the light back out again, and because of that, we see this flower as red. Red is the color of the only light that the flower does not absorb. 
Red is the one color that it reflects and gives back. And that is why we see the flower as red. Now what if a flower took in and kept all of the colors of the light? What color would it be? It would be dark, wouldn't it? It would be black. And this is true not only of flowers, but of all things. Listen carefully. That which you take and keep for yourself is not what you are, but what you are not. If a thing is kept, it is the thing of which you are empty. People who take and take and take and do not give are empty. People who want to be loved but who do not give love are the loveless. People who want to be blessed but who do not bless are the unblessed. They are the black flowers. What you give is what you are or what you will become. Now, I want to give full credit for this illustration to Jonathan Kahn from the Book of Mysteries. We're going to return to this flower and this thought in just a little while. But right now, I want to, to keep that in the back of your mind as I take you to St. Matthew's account of the feeding of 5,000 or more people. Before I read it, I want to point out that this story is one of the few stories of Jesus' life that is recorded for us in all four of the Gospels. One of the few, I say, other than the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is found in all the Gospels. This story is uh, told by all four of the Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and each one adds some additional details of what happened on this occasion. So uh, while we're going to be looking primarily at the Gospel of Matthew, I will also bring in some material from the other Gospels as well. Reading now from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from all of the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Now, this is a wonderful story of an amazing miracle. I'm sure you will agree. And this story, as with other scriptures, becomes even more meaningful and more incredible when you look at it in context. The passage began with the words, when Jesus heard what had happened. And so, as I read that, I thought, I better go back and see what just happened. Do you know what happened just before the feeding of the 5,000? Jesus' best friend. John had just been murdered. That's what happened. John the Baptist had been beheaded in prison. 
John was not only a friend, he was a close relative on Jesus' mother's side of the family. And he was the one who had baptized Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. As the forerunner of the Messiah, John was kind of like the opening act at a concert. It gets the crowd all warmed up before the main performer comes onto the stage. John was the first to recognize and to announce who Jesus really was. As he saw Jesus coming toward him, he had said to the crowd, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Having just received the news of John's execution, Jesus was looking for a quiet place where he could be alone with his grief and with his God. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place, the Bible says. But his time alone was not to be. Very quickly, his privacy was shattered, and the solitary place was invaded by a multitude needing his help. It says in the Bible, the crowds followed him on foot from all the towns. And I want you to notice what happened next. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Jesus put the needs of others ahead of his own. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And if we didn't already know how the story goes, we would expect Jesus to say something like, yes, send them away. I need a break. The reason I came here in the first place was because I wanted to be alone. But that's not what Jesus said, is it? Jesus instead said, says something very surprising. He says, they do not need to go away. And then he says something that is positively shocking. He tells his disciples, you give them something to eat. Well, the disciples kind of scratched their head and looked at one another, and they said, that would take more than half a year's wages. And uh, Philip, Philip, who was obviously the mathematics guru in the crowd, did some quick uh, calculating, and he looked at the size of the crowd, and uh, then he said, uh, it would, take, uh, it would take eight months' wages to feed all these people, and then they wouldn't get more than just a mouthful each. Well, eight months' wages couldn't do what Jesus was about to do. You know, it amazes me, as humans, that we have a tendency to focus on what we do not have, instead of on what we do have. They didn't even think to look to see what was available. They simply said, can't do it. That sounds impossible to us. But Jesus wanted them to take a look and see what they did have. He challenged their thinking. He caused them to focus on the resources that they did have available. Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. In other words, don't focus on what you have lost. Focus on what you have left. Well, when they found out, they came back to Jesus and they said, we have only five loaves and two fish. Notice that word only. Again, they're focused on scarcity, on lack, instead of seeing it as a resource with which God could work. What did Jesus say? Bring them here to me. What they had was small, but it was significant. 
What you have may not seem like much to you, but remember this, little is much when God is in it. Jesus took the loaves and the fish, and Scripture says that he looked up to heaven, the dwelling place of Almighty God. And he gave thanks. He looked to the source of all abundance. And then he took what he had. And he broke the loaves. And he gave them to his disciples. And the disciples gave them to the people. And it says they all ate and were satisfied. Now some people have said, well... They all just got a crumb, but because they were so filled with love, they felt like they'd had a full meal. Obviously, that does not explain what happened, because when they were all done, and they'd all eaten as much as they cared to do, there were 12 basketfuls of food picked up. There were a lot of leftovers. Now, John's Gospel provides a significant detail that the other writers don't mention. John tells us that it was Andrew, Peter's brother, who said to Jesus, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Here's the thing. When you give what you've got to God, you have no idea how far it will go. Whatever you have, give it to God. He can do far more with it than you ever could. What if that unnamed boy had insisted on keeping his lunch for himself? What if he had refused to give his lunch to Jesus? What if he'd insisted on getting credit for his generosity? I'll give this, but I want my name mentioned in the gospel. Here's a spiritual principle. There is no limit to what God can do through the woman or man, the boy or girl, who does not care who gets the credit. The boy gave his whole lunch to Jesus. Do you suppose he went home hungry? I think not. Everyone enjoyed his picnic lunch. But I'll bet that he enjoyed it most of all. And I imagine that he was sent home with a big basket full of leftovers to share with his family. What you have may be small, but it is significant in God's eyes. What you do with what you have gives it significance. Now perhaps you are thinking, I have only a little. I can't afford to give. It is because you do not give that you have only a little. If you seek to be blessed but do not bless, you will be unblessed. If you seek to be forgiven, but do not forgive, you will be unforgiven. If you seek to be loved, but do not love, you will be unloved. That which you would have in your life is the very thing that you must give back. You remember the red flower? Everything that you have is something which you have received. Every good thing in your life is a gift from God. Only that which you give back is what you will become. Some years ago, I had the opportunity to travel for a few weeks in the land of India. And for part of that time, I was in the company of a long-term missionary couple Bill and Mary Hoke. They had served there for many years, sharing the good news. 
and also sharing in many practical ways with the people of India. And as I traveled with them, I saw that they were continually giving things away. They'd buy something in the marketplace, and the next thing I knew, they were giving it to someone. In fact, uh, Bill Hoke was known among those who were acquainted with him as the giving man. That's a pretty neat way to be known. Give love, and you will become loving. Give hope, and you will become hopeful. Give joy, and you will become joyful. Give thanks, and you will become thankful. Give compassion, and you will become compassionate. When Mother Teresa received her Nobel Peace Prize, she accepted it, and I quote, in the name of the hungry, of the naked, of the homeless, of the blind, of the lepers, of all who feel unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. It is when you give your life to God that you receive his gift of eternal life. The light shines on every flower, but each flower becomes only the light that it gives back. God's love shines on everyone. But only that which you give back is what you are and what you will become. What happens to those who keep nothing for themselves, who give everything back? They become white. More than that, they become the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He also said, you are the light of the world. Commit to being a giver, freely giving of every blessing you have received. Start today, and your life will become a reflection of God. We pray. Father God, you so loved the world that you gave. You gave your one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Thank you for that reality. Thank you that Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is our light. And as we give, with his love, we become lights in this dark world, reflections of our Father in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.